On August 13, 1944, the rolling hills of Agoda, Poland, became the stage for a dramatic clash between two of World War II's most formidable armored forces. The Soviet Red Army and the German Wehrmacht were about to engage in a high-stakes game of cat and mouse, where the most feared beasts of steel from both sides would lock horns. On August 10, the first Ukrainian front crossed the Vistula River and pushed through enemy defenses to the southeast of Sandomir's, expanding their territory and bridgehead. In response, the Germans swiftly shifted five divisions, including the powerful 501st Heavy Panzer Division, from South Ukraine. They also brought in five infantry divisions from Germany, three from Hungary, and six assault gun brigades, to try and retake their lost ground, west of the Vistula. In anticipation of a German counterattack, the Soviet High Command ordered the reorganization of their troops. Their defensive preparations began with the strategic placement of extensive minefields. On August 11, the 6th Guards Tank Corps, from the 3rd Guards Tank Army, assumed defensive positions on the outskirts of the towns of Sildov and Agladov, both of which had been captured earlier on that day. At that moment, the bridgehead resembled an irregular semicircle, touching the Vistula River in the middle, while the 52nd Guards Tank Brigade protected the left side. But working with sandy soil posed challenges, as it caused trenches to collapse, when they tried to dig them deep enough to fully hide the tanks. Interestingly, the Germans also faced similar problems, due to the sandy ground. Soviet troops often witnessed Panther tanks navigating through the sandy terrain, where their drivers grappled to maintain control. This made the Panthers vulnerable, exposing their less protected side armor to Soviet gunfire. In the battles near Sildov and Agladov, this vulnerability resulted in substantial losses for the Panthers. On August 11, the 53rd Guards Tank Brigade alone, destroyed eight of the German heavy tanks. On August 12, the leadership of the 53rd Guards Tank Brigade, came to the conclusion that the Germans were unlikely to press on with a frontal assault, across the exposed sandy fields. Instead, they anticipated the Germans would attempt to encircle the brigade. To counter this, they strengthened their forces' flanks. The story unfolds just before the battle, with a captured German soldier mentioning the arrival of Panther tanks. It's worth noting, that he may not have been aware of the distinction, or chose not to disclose it, between the visually similar, Panther, and Tiger II or King Tiger. In truth, the differences between these two tanks are far less pronounced, compared to the contrast between the Tiger I and King Tiger. Even in the Soviet report, on tests conducted on the captured vehicle, it is described as, a modernized version of the Panther tank. On the night preceding the battle, two T-3485 tanks, one led by Guards Junior Lieutenant, Alexander Petrovich Oskin, and the other by Guards Captain Evushkin, accompanied by infantry tank riders, cautiously advanced toward the village of Ogledov. Given the difficulties the Germans had encountered in the sandy terrain, which had resulted in the immobilization and destruction of several Panther tanks around the group of villages, it was anticipated that the Germans would opt for more stable terrain. Evushkin's tanks positioned themselves in a field, famously disguised as haystacks. However, Oskin himself revealed a lesser-known twist to the tale. Initially, Oskin's crew tried to hide their tank by covering it with hay, which created a massive three-meter-tall haystack with a noticeable five-meter-long gun barrel, sticking out. This made it stand out, especially next to the other haystacks in the field, which were much smaller, barely a meter tall. Realizing the need for better camouflage, they spent the rest of the night reshaping the smaller haystacks, to resemble tanks more closely. 
On the misty morning of August 13, the dense fog masked the Soviet ambush. At 7 a.m., Ivushkin alerted his comrades to the distant sound of tanks drawing closer. These proved to be 11 fearsome brand new King Tiger tanks. These formidable machines were supported by armored personnel carriers transporting infantry, ready for what lay ahead. The tanks came into view for the 53rd Guards Tank Brigade. The commander described the unfolding scene like this. A massive tank rolled up from the valley. It moved in fits and starts, struggling in the sandy terrain. Major Korobov signaled from the left flank, they're approaching. I responded, hold on, wait for it. Open fire at 400 meters. Another tank appeared, followed by a third. They had significant gaps between them. By the time the third tank appeared, the first had already passed Avushkin's ambush. Should we fire? he asked. Yes, open fire, I responded. I observed the haystack that concealed Oskin's tank move, and then, his gun barrel emerged, and it twitched, again and again. Oskin unleashed a barrage of fire. I witnessed black holes appearing on the sides of the enemy tanks, one after the other. Soon, one tank burst into flames. The third tank attempted to pivot towards Oskin, but its track was knocked off, leaving it immobilized, and Oskin swiftly delivered the final blow. I signaled to all units to fire. Thirty guns opened fire directly, and the howitzer divisions unleashed a barrage of indirect fire, blanketing the valley. Ogledov was concealed, in a swirling cloud of sand and smoke. As the day drew to a close, the 53rd secured the southern slope of height 247.9, positioned just 300 meters east of Ogledov. They dispatched two tanks from the 3rd Tank Battalion, and a company of submachine gunners to enter the village, and successfully cleared it of enemy forces by 8 a.m. Inside the village, additional Tiger II tanks were found, deserted by their crews after the attack had failed. It was only at this point, that the Soviets realized they were facing these new tanks. Oskin initially reported that he had taken out three Panthers. The commander recounted the situation, saying, two hours later, a sort of calm settled over the battlefield. Our scouts brought word of two undamaged tanks closer to Ogledov, stranded in the sand at a turn. On our left flank, we stumbled upon another one that had ventured into a swampy pool and was abandoned. The crew departed in such a rush, that they left their documents behind. It turned out that these new tanks were massive, weighing in at a staggering 68 tons. However, the battle was not yet over, and there remained additional encounters with these new tanks. Infantry moving towards Zerez, faced heavy fire from additional King Tigers. In response, a platoon of IS-2 tanks, led by Senior Lieutenant Klemenkov, joined the fray. Klemenkov successfully destroyed two King Tigers, with one of them igniting in flames. On the other hand, the fate of the other King Tiger held a unique twist. In the early hours before dawn, a tank platoon led by company commander Klemenkov, took up their positions close to Ogledov. The 2nd Battalion of the 294th Self-Propelled Artillery attacked Ogledov, but was met with resistance from enemy tanks concealed behind a house and some bushes on the southern edge of the village. The infantry's advance was brought to a standstill, prompting us to send a report to Klemenkov. Comrade Klemenkov climbed to a vantage point, and fired two shots, demolishing the house that was shielding the enemy tank. As the enemy tank began to pull back, Klemenkov's next shot damaged one of its tracks, rendering it immobile. 
the enemy crew abandoned the tank and escaped. Our infantry seized the tank, turned its turret toward the enemy, and opened fire. A total of seven Tiger II tanks advanced from the direction of Moker. IS-2 tank, commanded by Guard Senior Lieutenant Yudilov, engaged them, opening fire from a distance of 800 meters. Yudilov's accurate shots destroyed two Tiger IIs, with one of them catching fire. In response, the German tanks fell back, reorganized, and launched a new offensive toward Paniki. Lieutenant Belyakov's IS-2 tank lay in ambush in that direction. When the enemy column was within 1,000 meters, Belyakov's precise fire set one Tiger II ablaze. This forced the remaining tanks to retreat once again. In the course of three days, from August 11th to August 13th, seven King Tigers were completely destroyed, while six were captured, mostly undamaged. Among the captured tanks was a commander's vehicle, containing valuable maps and instruction manuals for these new tanks. This information was verified by a captured German soldier. On August 16, another captured soldier from the 501st Heavy Panzer Battalion attested that the battalion had initially formed with 20 Tiger II tanks and 20 Panzer IVs. However, at that time, the battalion had only 26 tanks remaining. The commander of the 53rd remembered, it's quite challenging to determine which unit destroyed which tanks. Couple of battalions opened fire simultaneously, and we had two artillery battalions, along with two self-propelled gun regiments, all engaged the enemy. Ground attack planes also played a vital role. Oskin's crew undeniably set three tanks ablaze, and disabled another. Oskin himself received the prestigious title of Hero of the Soviet Union, while his gunner, Abubakar Mirhaidorov, was honored with the Order of Lenin. All members of the crew were recognized with well-deserved medals, for their role in the battle at Ogledov. 